Yes, sir. I just sent, sent another link in the chat. So that's related, related to the workshop today. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So welcome everyone. This is the first lecture in the Quant University Summer School series. As you all know, Quant University has been hosting these workshops for the past two years, and we have had various topics in machine learning, data science, and the aspects of how do you responsibly adopt machine learning and data science related products in the enterprise. So my name is Sri Krishnamurthy from Quant University, and I've had the pleasure to engage with you all in the community to bring in various ideas and introduce you to various concepts and methodologies which are happening in the industry. We have also had the pleasure to invite various renowned academics, practitioners, thought leaders in the area of machine learning and AI. And it's always great to see how the confluence of various ideas which are being brought together as we make this process of looking at machine learning and AI more rigorous in the industry. Uh, as a part academic, I am very much engaged in the discussion on what's happening in the academia and the amount of research which is happening to make sure that the artificial intelligence and machine learning products which are being used in the industry are made more robust. But I'm also very intrigued and interested in understanding how practitioners are adopting these methodologies. And in this realm, it's, it's very hard to kind of you know, draw a line of you know, what, what is actually a tried and tested method. And uh, that's where I'm very much pleased to invite today, uh, Agus Sujianto, who is the leader in the space of model risk management for machine learning models. And his experience of basically building out a whole practice from the ground up at Wells Fargo has enabled various industry practitioners and thought leaders to look up on the tried and tested best practice methodologies, which are grounded in theory, but also adopted and put together in practice on how things should be done in the world. Now, uh, Ajun Zhang, who works with Agus, has been generous enough with his time to help us kind of uh, understand and navigate through the package which he and his team has developed. And it's called PyML, which is a, a short form for Python toolbox for interpretable machine learning. And uh, in today's workshop and in the next part, which is gonna happen uh, next week, we will be talking about the theory and the practitioner aspects of how to use this particular package. Uh, a formal introduction, uh, Agus Sujianto leads the corporate model risk function and he's the executive vice president at Wells Fargo. He's responsible for enterprise model risk. Uh, Agus is no stranger to the enterprise world. You know, he has been uh, a prolific speaker and a guest speaker and an invited speaker at various uh, industrial and academic forums. Uh, he is, uh, I don't know where he finds the time. He has uh, multiple publications and I'm always fascinated to see the quality of research he and his colleagues put together. And um, it's always a pleasure to chat with him. He's a, he's a dear friend and I always uh, seek his advice whenever we put together programs or think about topics, which we do here at Quant University. Um, Agus holds a master's and a doctorate degree in engineering and management from Wayne State University and from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And Adrian, uh, leads the interpretable machine learning function at the corporate uh, model risk at uh, Wells Fargo. Uh, he has also a ton of experience working at Bank of America, uh, Merrill Lynch and various enterprise uh, credit risk roles. And he also has uh, well, you know, a very rigorous academic experience. He has uh, worked at uh, Hong Kong Baptist University and he holds BS and uh, MPhil degrees in mathematics and statistics from Hong Kong Baptist University and a PhD degree in statistics from the University of Michigan at Ann Harbor. So I'm very pleased to welcome you both, uh, Ajun and Agus. And as you all know, this is a part of the Quant University uh, Summer School. So Quant University, as you all know, has been putting together various training programs and uh, we have been hosting a five part artificial intelligence and machine learning risk certificate program, which we have developed in partnership with Premier. And uh, this program is formally uh, launched uh, in January and it's going on. And students get a chance to take five formal courses over a period of five months and get to do a capstone project at the end. So the whole certificate program is a six month certificate program. Along the program, 
we invite guest speakers uh, pr pr predominantly on Tuesday afternoons or Wednesday afternoons and host various workshops so that the participants get a chance to not only look at the theory and the lab and the workshop material, but also get a feel for what else is happening in the industry and get to learn from industry practitioners. So if you're interested in learning more about our programs, just go to www.pontuniversity.com and you can see the various programs we offer. So with that, I would like to invite uh, Agus Sujianto to the stage. So wel welcome Agus and take it away. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Sri, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so in the next uh, couple hours, we're going to talk about how we look at machine learning and how we validate machine learning. I would like to give a few introductions first, quick introduction, and then we're going to delve into the, uh, the techniques as well as some of the uh, demo using the uh, software. Uh, let me share my screen. So I hope every one of you can see the screen. Uh, let me go to uh, the first page, if I may, okay? Uh, here what I would like to, uh, to say a few words in terms of AutoML. Uh, one, uh, because this is, uh, everybody talk about AutoML, everywhere is very popular, everywhere you see is AutoML. But I would like to say this, and this is going to be the theme of the presentation and the theme of the code, the software inside uh, PyML, okay? Don't just trust your AutoML. In machine learning, uh, we have what we call it multiplicity or, or Rashomon effect and benign overfitting. Uh, you can have multiple models that the performance wise almost the same but they are completely different model. So let me give an example here on the chart on the right. So if you look at uh, the horizontal is model complexity. If you think about XG boost is basically deeper tree and more boosting. So the more the deeper tree, uh, the deeper, uh, the more boosting on the training, the error will keep going down. And what happened, the interesting as well is on the testing, it's going down and stay flat and stay flat or uh, even when the model more complex, the performance still okay. And if you think about this, this is the phenomena of benign overfitting. And the thing that I talk about Rashomon effect is you can have a similar output, but very different models. Yeah, and I think the great uh, Leo Bremen, a uh, couple, uh, couple decades ago, talked about this, uh, this problem. So here is what you see in the bottom right. You see a lot of model with different complexity. If you look at the testing performance, they're almost the same, but they are completely different model because some of those are more simpler model, the other more complicated model. So various choice of hyperparameter tuning can give similar predictive performance. An unsound model, model that doesn't make sense, can also have very good performance. So that's the problem. Uh, so this is the a, a, a problem that plague uh, in the machine learning. And if you use AutoML, you're going to be a, a victim of this. Model explainability is very useful to uncover troubling spot. Where is the model uh, makes sense or not? But explainer, post hoc explainer, like Lime, Sharp, PDP, and all of those things can be easily wrong. And Agent in the presentation today will give a lot of example, uh, real example, and you can try it yourself with IML when they can be very wrong. So we advocate the use of inherently interpretable model to provide confidence. So, and when we talk about interpretable, inherently interpretable model, it's not the good old trend of regression, simple regression. We're talking about complex model that inherently interpretable, be it deep neural networks that we're going to make it interpretable. And Ajun will talk about how to make it even more interpretable to put architecture constraint and you will the demo in the code uh, somewhere in PyML, you will see that. The other thing is because the uh, performance almost the same. So we need to choose really, we need to pick which model that will be robust when you deploy it. 
that you will not have problem when you deploy it because in the performance, they are almost the same. In fact, we're going to show later, agent will show it as well, that we may choose model that performance is less because that model will be more robust or more reliable and more resilient. So in the second uh, uh, lecture, today's lecture is going to be focused on interpretable machine learning. The next lecture next week, we'll be talking about how do we detect benign overfitting? How are we going to talk about robustness? How are you going to look at reliability? How are we going to test for resiliency? All those detailed testing that beyond just simple accuracy or performance testing, that's very, very critical to deploy machine learning safely and reliably in real environment. And that tool are all in the PyML as well. So let me go to uh, one slide and then I'll turn it to agent. So when we talk about this and about model validation or machine learning, we talk about two main concepts, conceptual soundness, and the second one is outcome analysis. When we talk about conceptual soundness, we talk about overfitting, we talk about causality, we talk about explainability and interpretability. So in today's lecture, we're going to talk about explainability and interpretability. In the outcome analysis, we talk about error analysis, finding which region in the model that the model will be weak. We're talking about reliability, how reliable is the decision or the prediction from the model. We talk about bias and fairness. We talk about robustness, how robust the model is with the data that's uh, corrupt, data the corruption and real world. And then we talk about resiliency, how the model will perform under distribution shift. We want to do all of this before the model are deployed in real world. So all this testing, including uh, sensitivity to distribution drift will be done at the, at the validation level. This is why we put the uh, PyML tool. So most of this capture in the current release of PyML. So the causality and bias fairness is not in PyML yet, but stay tuned, it will be, but the rest are in PyML. So with that, Adrian, I'll turn it to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, August. Uh, thank you, Sri, for invitation. So it's my honor to share some of the latest developments, as I was mentioned, on so-called PyML. So let me share the screen. Uh, I should do this one, right? I right, so we can see my screen, right, Sri? Yeah, very good, Ajahn. Yes, we can see oh. it. Oh, maybe I let me reshare, because I want to share desktop. I just shared the... Uh, let me share. I, I should share the desktop. Sorry, I should share the desktop. Yeah, this is one. Yeah. So I uh, I made a very nice introduction about like a model machine machine learning model validation, and also the important elements for model validation like uh, conceptual soundness and outcome testing. So let me now go to the details. Yeah, so this is the agenda for this session and then also the one for next time. So today we will talk about the machine learning interpretability. You know, we focus on this. And I will give an overview of what is interpretable ML and also introduce a PI ML toolbox. After that, we will talk about the post hoc explainability tools, which are very popular today. But unfortunately, many of those tools have limitation and are puzzled. You know, after that, so we will discuss how to design models which are inherently interpretable, and then we will give some examples for that purpose. Okay, so that's a quick agenda. So let me now talk about, uh, you know, like interpretable machine learning. I think many of you, may, many of us, you know, should already be familiar with this uh, terminology. Uh, it is new, but it's actually not that new. Uh, actually, uh, let me start with uh, a paper I cited here from Leo Bryman, which I just now mentioned. So called statistical modeling, the two cultures, which are very popular and everybody know that in statistical science. So basically, as I uh, show on the, on the diagram, also as I, you know, texted on the right hand side, right? So 20 years ago, which, when the paper was written, you know, more than 20 years ago, actually. So the people, most of, uh, most of statisticians actually work on the model, focus on the models, uh, starting from like uh, data, data, then hypothesis. Now, given hypothesis, for example, normal hypothesis, right? Your yeah, normal hypothesis or Gaussian distribution, then we can fit a linear models and we can do diagnostics and have some so-called like a Gauss theorem. So you have a lot, lot of like 
those nice theory, not nice theory uh, and the methodology. And that's the majority 20 years ago. Uh, so which represents actually the here, the, uh, the right corner, right? This is a red circles. So like a linear regression and also logistic regression and a little have decision tree, right? Decision tree also, you know, have a nice uh, interpretation of, of, of the, the method based on the rule and also get generalized entity model, right? That's a very classical statistical models. And most of statisticians like 20 years ago focus on that, that area. However, there's a change, you know, as in a paper by Professor Leo Bryman, and uh, there's a shift in the last 20 years, actually and more and more people switch from, you know, data hypothesis to just the algorithm prediction. You know, the models are becoming, you know, more and more complex. For example, we have that support the machine, right? Actually in the middle, there's a you know, single neuro hidden neural network, which is called artificial neural network, which is a single hidden layer, right? And also support the machine with the kernel, kernel, kernel trick. And then we have like uh, examples of the trees, like decision tree, instead of a single tree, we have many, 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 many trees as examples together. So we have the random forest, and then if we, if we do that sequentially, then we have a GBM, gradient boosting machine, right? And, uh, and then later on, we have like artificial intelligence, right? Like, like a new, like, uh, you know, a momentum, you know, comes in and now everybody talk about the AI and then deeper neural networks, right? See, the models become more and more complex. And now actually it turns out these models are becoming more and more black box. Black box, that means we, we don't really know what's happening within the model. But although it have a higher, you know, higher and higher prediction accuracy, which is represented in this diagram on the, you know, y axis. That, you know, by the way, this chart is just a schematic chart uh, diagram. It's only meant on, on the average sense. So, so on average, so we have this kind of comparison, you know, from like uh, uh, lower right to upper left. You know, it's a trade off between prediction accuracy and at the same time, so it, it has sacrificed model interpretability. If the model becomes more and more complex. Then starting from like uh, several years ago, like 2017 from like a uh, US DAPA, in a, a agency of your Department of Defense. So then like uh, David Ghani, like Mr. Ghani, and I uh, proposed this concept called XAI. So arti explainable artificial intelligence. So it's also known now today as interpretive machine learning. You know, some of, sometimes these terms are used uh, exchangeably. You know, we, we can even also call explainable machine learning or, you know, so the, the, for, for, from now on, let's just focus on IML. That's our, you know, we use this term, uh, term okay, or acronym. So, so you see that uh, this is like a shift from 20 years ago to today. Now it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a change, it's a shift. But now we're talking about, uh, we're going to talk about that actually, you know, the data hypothesis, you know, not the hypothesis, I mean, the model interpretation actually should be taken care of. So then it seems to be another regime change. Okay, so next one. So now I give, uh, uh, just now, I just gave, gave a landscape of interpret uh, of machine learning, right? So in terms of interpreter machine learning, so in recent years, there are very main, there are quite a lot of uh, developments, uh, which uh, we you know classified into two category. You know, like one is like inherently uh, interpreter models, so which is model specific, and the other one is also called a uh, post hoc explainability, which is a model agnostic. Okay. So the first one category actually has two uh, uh, sub category. One is like models which have low performance. The other one has high performance. Now low performance is basically what I mentioned. Are th those are statistical models like a linear logistic regression or decision tree of a shallow one, and also a generalized editing model, right? These are statistical models. It's uh, it's uh, you know it's not new, but it's a uh, it's a uh, very easy to interpret, uh, straightforward to interpret. But uh, uh, it has low performance, especially when we feed, uh, want to fit the uh, large data or big data with this kind of simplified model, which are just uh, too simplified to capture the pattern in the big data, all right? So the other category is the high performance. Uh, okay, I, as I have outlined here, so this is actually our R&D focus. So we have developed, developed quite a, some methods like Gaminet, uh, this EBM is for Microsoft research, which is also a very, you know, can, uh, very good model. And a GIM, but uh, with boosting and a sim boosting, sim tree boosting, and also, it turns out uh, our research uh, results uh, finding that find that like a uh, ReLU DNA turns out to be also uh, locally, you know, interpretable. 
And when we do that like, specification of the relative DNA, it can be even uh, you know e more interpretable. And other models, you know, like XNA and then enhanced XNA explainable neural networks, which has a network architecture constraints. These constraints are imposed for purpose in order to enhance the model interpretability. So we will come to that point later. Okay. So the other category, uh, you know, is for any kind of model. It's not a model specific. It's for any, even for black box model. When it, uh, whenever a model is fitted, right, then we can use like a model prediction and to do, you know, try to do like a post processing, you know, in a post hoc way. You know, it doesn't matter which model it is, but we can always uh, like give some explanations. This is called a mo uh, post hoc or model agnostic explanation, right? So it includes like uh, several different tra uh, approaches, including global explanation, local explanation. And uh, the difference is like global is to extend the model overall, you know, overall behavior of the model to fit the entire data. However, local explanation is for an individual instance or individual sampling points, right? For a, for a point as the uh, prediction, what, what, uh, what, you know, what's a, a contribution for different uh, uh, features? Uh, this is called like a local explanation. So they, then we have the method like a lime, shape, and also kind of factual, so on and so forth, right? This is uh, lime and shape are most popular today. Uh, many people talk about that, and we will show that these methods actually have some problems. You know, we have to use in caution. You know, global ones, including like a variable importance, like a uh, 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 permutation feature importance, and a shape, uh, you know, shape can be aggregated to have like a feature importance measure, and a, a PDP partial dependence, individualized uh, uh, conditional expectation, and also AOE accum accumulated local effects, so on and so forth, right? So we'll come to this later. You know, I just give an overview quickly about the, these two different uh, methods. And uh, another one, the third one is actually is try to do approximation of the uh, you know, black box model. When the original model is very complicated or complex, for example, a deeper neural network, which have many, many layers, say 100 layers, right? Each layer have multiple nodes. Then we can do like a model compression. You know, model compression also called a knowledge distillation. So we can have a simple model. For example, we can use a tree uh, we can use like a GIM, right, to approximate, you know, maybe locally or maybe globally, right? But this is like a so-called simple model approximation or model compression. So this is another category of the methods. Okay, so same days, so then we'll come to like PyML. PyML represents Python toolbox for interpretable machine learning. So it actually, you know, we're, we're going to cover, use, uh, you know, develop uh, such a toolbox, which can cover most of these methods as uh, surveyed here. Okay, but uh, we will focus you know, on the inherently interpreted models with high performance. So that's our focus. Okay, so next one. So, you know, so PyML, right? PyML, uh, this is like uh, the toolbox, the, the, like, uh, the purpose or, or scope of the toolbox uh, is including the following two, you know, box, right? One is model development. The other one is the model validation, okay? So model development, uh, we include this several like uh, models just surveyed in the previous slide, and also we have we cover both inherently, you know, model inherent or model specific interpretability, and also we have this uh, post hoc explainability tools, you know. But uh, as I mentioned, we have to use these tools with caution. You know, I will explain why. Okay, the other one is uh, like a model explain validation. You know, for a model which can be either you know trained from this, uh, developed from this pipeline or some existing uh, model. So we can do this kind of arc outcome testing or model diagnostics. And we can even do like a model comparison or benchmarking. And you know, you know these this are very important in model validation today in the banking industry. Okay, and uh, what's special about PyML is that uh, like it has a very convenient uh, local interface and uh, we will demonstrate that. And also it supports high code uh, like API or for manual programming, okay? So this is like a general instruction, you know, about the scope of the PyML toolbox, which is, which is a, a kind of like ambitious, but uh, we will show it's indeed quite powerful. So next page, I just share with you for the first time, you know, this is a, a rough, very you know, fresh chart I, I just had to draw, uh, draw recently. So this is about like a workflow design for PyML toolbox. It has three, three you know, uh, approaches. One is the low code, you know, on a high level, low code. So we started with data dashboard, and then we develop what's called a interpretable. Also, some people call it the glass box models, right? On each, these models can go to interpret. Interpret is a verb operation of the toolbox. You see that on the right hand side, well, we have the four uh, operation or verbs. One is the interpret. The other one is the explain, which is the post hoc explanation. 
and also diagnosis for model diagnostics and the compare is for model comparison and benchmarking. Okay, so you can see that like a local, there's like an interpretable glass box models can go four, four ways into each of these. However, for high code and existing, like in a, in a high code, you know, the, you know, we had basically do like a, as, as usual, right? We do like a Python coding. So for, you know, which you uh, data scientists usually do, right? We have the model, you know, data loaded and uh, pro, uh, pre-processed. And then we can make a feature to feature engineering. The data that we can fit a model, uh, whatever model, like a black box model, for example, a, a GBM, right? So this model then can go to like explain, but it cannot go to interpret, okay? Because this model, some of the, most of the black box models actually are not inherently interpretable. They cannot go to interpret. We can only go to explain and also diagnose and compare. That's for the middle one. And the one below is actually existing pipeline for some models which are pre-trained, right? I mean, even including the models which are already in production. So how can we diagnose or explain those models? So we have PyML support that, right? PyML can actually do so-called, uh, support this so-called uh, pipeline registration. So this here pipeline, including not only the model, but also the data set, also even, you know, the, the, like, uh, the processing steps. So all of this uh, will be combined together as a pipeline, which can be registered into PyML. Then we can do just like a box model, right? We can do explain, diagnose, and compare. So this is like a general diagram or workflow for, for, the, for the PyML toolbox. You see that it's quite comprehensive, right? So now uh, another one. Okay, so how can we, you know, try out, you know, try try out this toolbox? Uh, it, it it is actually on the, you know, on the uh, GitHub. Okay, so here I provide the link. If you have time, maybe can you please type this uh, URL? Then I will show you, you know, how to do the demo. So we will we use the GitHub, and it includes all the material we're we're going to cover today. You know, it can be easily installed by PIP install. And, uh, you know, it just, uh, what, what, I, what we are proud of is, is that this is just the first release uh, on May 4th. You know, that's just like a, uh, one month and a half ago, right? Uh, we released like a point one version. And now we have recently released a point two version, just maybe 2.0, right? So it is a second digit, like a second major update, just uh, two days ago, uh, three days ago. Right, so then we already have uh, you know more than three hundred stars on GitHub, okay, and then you know this is actually uh, we we know a lot of people now uh you know are talking about this PyML and even do some experimentation based on PyML, and uh, we uh, but still we request a lot of like inquiry about like uh, what what is the methodology behind you know what what is the theory or what what is you know the details so that's the purpose for today so we will explain. You know what? How what, what some of the you know methodology behind PyML toolbox, and it's also you know very convenient that you can try it directly by clicking a link on GitHub. I will demo to you, uh, demonstrate how to do that. Then you can you know use like a free you know CPU or GPU uh, from Google Collab. You know today we use uh, Google Collab CPU uh, environments to do all the job, all the uh, computing, and uh, you know example case studies. And in the same time, I want to uh, give a small announcement. So actually, on the GitHub, we are going to release a series of reproducible, uh, you know, you know, reproducible means the notebooks. You know, these notebooks or codes uh, can be reproducible to generate the generate the same results, exactly the same results. Uh, you know, may not exactly the same. You know, I will explain why because different machines have different random seeds, uh, different random sorted number generation, but basically they have more or less the same results. And then. You know, we'll provide you tutorials explaining each of these methods. And I will start with like postdoc explainability tools, especially the puzzles, the puzzle part. And then we will discuss inherent interpretable and so on and so forth. You know, many of these will be covered in a, in a two day you know, to, uh, workshop uh, here, but uh, we will also provide like uh, tutorials, you know, written you know, documentation for all of this. But uh, stay tuned, we will, we will need some time to release one by one. Okay, so I put a demo on the top right corner. So that means we will switch to, uh, to the browser. Let me do that here. Okay. Uh, it's a bit slow. Okay, so the, you see here, this is a PyML toolbox. Oops, I click a uh, link somewhere. But anyway, so uh, yeah, so this is a PyML toolbox. It has a uh, induction. 
about her box, you know, it says, uh, you know, pi ML, pi ML, you know, so as pronounced uh, pi ML machine learning. So it's a new Python tool box for interpretable, you know, and so on, so for low code and high code, right? So this is uh, also includes some high code examples, low code examples. So this, each of this link here with a, a collab, Google collab symbol, that means you can click on it and then it will, it will direct you to the, you know, free environment, but, but, but you need a, a Gmail account in order to use uh, Google Collab, okay? But that's for the Pima box. So for today's workshop, so we recently added this like a docs, you know, docs here. If you click docs, so this is a placeholder. So we will release like uh, the tutorials on here, you know, and uh, we will have more and more materials, you know, as time goes. And then workshop is here, okay? So workshop here, you see, uh, you, there has two workshops of, uh, today, including the one for today, right? So one is like a, uh, like a master class by Goose and uh, Vijanaya. So which they, they delivered this workshop in NYC like a month ago, May 9th, and also three, you know, helped with the demonstration. So we have all the slides here, which you can take a look. And then for today's workshop, that's what I want to do, okay? So machine learning, you know, for June 9 and Ju July 6, right? So the slides will be shared here, but here, these are two examples we want to use today, okay? So we'll click on here, just click on here. Then you are, you are going to come to this side, okay? If you click on the link. So this is a machine learning model validation, as I uh, put it here. So I will start demo. Like, uh, first of all, this is a free environment, right? You need to uh, install it. You just click on here, okay? Just click on here. So it will install PyML directly from PyP, okay? So actually I already installed, so everything is satisfied. Try, it's a bit slow. How can I hide this? Uh, anyway. Okay, so then you, yeah, if you install it for the first time, you probably have to, uh, you know, as I mentioned here, you have to restart uh, like a uh, kernel. You need to uh, like uh, uh, restart the runtime in order to have user newly installed. But I already installed, so which is fine. Let me just uh, click this uh, off. But then you can just do a PIP show PyML. You will see this is the latest version, actually, which is uh, updated recently, 0.2.1. Okay, this is the latest version. And maybe next week or, or, or maybe a month later, you will see a, a, another update. So you can just show, uh, just do PIP show to see what's the latest update, what's the version you are, you, you will install, okay? And then now let's do, do the demo, okay? Uh, like uh, let's just initialize. So then I always just demo like a load the data part. Then we'll come to like interpret machine learning. So you just uh, initiate uh, experiment, okay? By loading, uh, by so called EXP. Okay, you can name it whatever you like, but I just call EXP to represent experiment. Now you have this, right? So let me just uh, run this, uh, you know, in real time. So low code, interface, right, just do exp dot data loader, okay? Data loader will, you know, give us like interface. Interface, you can select different data sets. You can also upload your own data sets, okay? So for this one, for let's choose the bike sharing data sets. If you, if you do this kind of like selection, the data will be, uh, will appear here, okay? You know, it, you see that it has more than 17,000 records and about maybe nine or 10, and more than, actually more than 10, columns, okay? So you have this, then you can do what? You can do data summary, right? Just like a numerical and a, you know, graphical summary. Let's do that. Yeah, please bear with me because I'm, I'm sharing the screen, uh, Zoom, so the, it occupies my CPU a little bit. Sometimes it's not a super smooth, but it should, should be okay. So, right, so you can just do click, click this, you will show the data summary of this, this chart, right? Yeah, maybe I should clean, uh, clear, or clean, clear, because this is like some existing results just for your reference. But if you click on this, it's run, you know, the new code and uh, running on the real time. Okay, so now here, as I mentioned here, some of the variables are highly correlated. So to do a better model, right? So we, we should exclude the variables. It has both numerical and categorical. It has like a, you know, summary, numerical summary, and also the frequency. And it's like a standard, you know, standard deviation, average, and a five, five number of summary. So here, as I mentioned here, so you can remove some variables. Say if we wanna, there's a temperature at A temp, this is a highly correlated, right? So we should remove one of them, just exclude, right? Exclude, then it will be in a grade out. 
And I, another variable is the season. Season is just like for, for season, right? Which is uh, correlated, actually, which is absorbed by months. Months is 12 months, okay? Like from January to December. And the season is just for seasons, obviously. Season is just a subset of months, right? So uh, we don't need a season, which is redundant. So let's remove season as well. Okay, season is not shown here, because season is categorical. It's here, season is gone. And another one, working day, you know, what is working day? Working day is like, a, uh, you know, work day or weekend day. It's an indicator of, of the weekends, right? Which is actually, uh, you know, absorbed by weekday. We have weekday from like Monday to, to Sunday, right? So weekday is also not needed. So let's do that. Oh, sorry, working day, working day, right? So let's do this and now that working, working day is gone. So what's remain is like the clean, clean data, right? We, what, do we, uh, uh, what do we call as clean data? So then we can do data preparation for the modeling purpose. Okay, let's just do this modeling, right? Um, uh, you know, it's uh, you know, it automatically you know uh, uh, determine what is the target variable. Basically, which we use the last column. But uh, if in some cases, like uh, if it's not the last column, not the variable, you can just manually select and then update. And it depends on the you know variable type. That this is CNT is a count of the bicycle rental, right? So this CNT you know it's a continuous variable. It will automatically classified as a regression problem. Right, but if, if sometimes it's not exactly the case, then you can update. And then we also have a random say, it's just to make sure that you can reproduce the results, you know, in a, in a later time. And also a test ratio, like to split data, 20% for testing purpose and 80% for training purpose. Okay, that's essentially what do we do. You know, then let's do EDF. After this, we will come to the slides, okay? So then EDF part, right? So it's basically includes like univariate, Bivariate and a multivariate plots to, to see what's have what's in the data set, right? So before we do the any modeling, we should get familiar with what's in the data, right? Year is just like, like a just actually two year, right? Like a, I think it's like a 20, 20, 20 or 2021, 20, right? Two year period. Maybe I'm wrong, but this is two different years consecutively. And the month is just 12 months, right? If you do that. And also if you have other variables, say temperature, you will see temperature is a continuous variable. You see the histogram. And also you see the density plot. It's, it's like a model, but it's a beta bimodal. It's like a normal, but a bimodal. Okay. And we can also see that uh, the relationship between like an independent variable and a target variable, right? Target target variable, which is CNT, right? Then we can have like, a, what's the, like, a, you know, the difference between like a year, one year and another year. And also the, let's say temperature or, you know, what's the, what's the relationship, right? You see this scatter plot. And also uh, another variable is called an hour, right? Hour is basically from you know one a.m. like to uh, twenty-four, you know, you know, twenty-four hours, you know, uh, you know, the 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 whole day period, right? You see this kind of like the, the histogram. Uh, actually, it's not a histogram. Sorry, here this should be bar charts. Okay, so then well, you can also see like a correlation, and you can see some variables are highly correlated, but some of them are less correlated. So this car kind of correlation. Actually, if you see that, right, the uh, community and the win, uh, win speed, they actually are uh, negatively correlated. And also some other variables are ne positively correlated. Okay, so then this will give us some ideas about the data set before we do the modeling. Okay, so this is like a first, first demo of the round. Then let's come back to the slides. So this is just to get you familiar, you know, give you some idea what is uh, PyMail does, especially the local. code. So look at this, you see that it's very convenient. It just give a type of, uh, you don't even type, right? Because all, all, all of this code is already here, but if you wanna start with uh, your, your own notebook, you can just copy and paste, it, which is very simple. After that, it just do like, a, you know, this kind of selection, go down or have some other uh, control elements. Then you can have like, it's just like a software, like play, uh, you know, you can have fun with that, okay? So that's for the first part. Okay, so now let's move to the next part. Okay, so we already have, uh, have a, a brief idea about PyML, but we, so far we haven't talked about the machine learning and we haven't talked about the interpretation or explanation, right? So next part, I will start with like, uh, what do some people usually do today? Okay, they started, they like to do black box modeling. And then to explain the model, they use like post hoc methods. So let's review them, okay? But uh, as I put it here, we have to, use this with caution, and I will explain why. Okay, so here is a quick summary of this post hoc explainability tools. 
So what is post hoc, right? Actually, I already made, uh, explained a little, bit, a little bit in a taxonomy or, or that like a diagram before. So there is a model agnostic approach. It's only applied when the model is, is developed, okay? So no matter which model it is, but uh, if the model is developed, it's there, then you can apply these methods. So it's basically it's a one fits all, you know, approach. You have many, many models, but you can have just a single single approach to do the job, okay? So it's called a model agnostic. So it's useful for explaining black box models, okay? And about most of these black box models, as I reviewed before, uh, uh, you know, surveyed before, uh, below, sorry, so have potential limitation, okay? So look at explainability tools, including uh, they're explaining individual prediction line, so-called, uh, you know, local interpretable model agnostic approach uh, explanation, and the Sharpie is repre uh, represents a Sharpie additive explanation, and the global tools for uh, explaining the overall impact of the features on the model predictions. The methods including like two two different uh, two on you know two branches. One is to uh, ex examine you know relative importance of each each variable. Say like we have multiple variables you know, by sharing like uh, hour, temperature, or year, or month, and we, we would uh, want to know which variable is most important. Which one is the second important? Which one is not important, right? This is called like a, a examine re relative importance of individual variables, right? So for this purpose, then we have to call the VI, PFI, Sharp FI, I will explain why. I, I, explain, I, I explain them in the next slide. And also other than this, this is just a importance which is usually just a single index, a single number, right, to quantify. But we also want to understand the input output relationship. For example, a single variable say hour, or temperature for the bike sharing data sets. So which one, you know, so, so suppose we know like uh, temperature is important. And uh, you know, furthermore, we want to understand how they affect, you know, for different temperature, what's the response, you know? So then what's this is called a partial dependence. So we have PDP, partial dependence plot or individualized uh, ICE, and also AOE accumulated and actual statistics for fit interactions. Suppose we want to understand like a, a pair of the variables, how they affect you know, their model prediction jointly. So then we can apply this is called a edge statistic. All of these are post hoc, okay? All of these are model agnostic. So now let's come to, so, oh, okay. We will start with like, look explanability to us. So line, so quickly uh, introduce that, is that, so suppose, you know, uh, forget about line for, for, for the time being, okay? Suppose we have a interpreter model, like a FX equal to beta, you know, this is a linear model, right? We have a D variables, so we have an intercept plus beta one times x one, so on and so forth, up to beta d times x z, right? All of us uh, learn about this in statistics 101, right? So this is a linear regression model, and now we actually know how to interpret this, uh, how to explain this, right? So by so-called like every unit change, right? That's what we usually learn for in, in, in statistics class. Every unit change in x one, right? And then the change of the you know response would be beta one times x one. Uh, okay, x1 is theta, x1 is 1, right? The change is just a beta 1. It can be both positive or negative, right? This is called like a change, this sensitivity, a unit change of beta 1. Or if you want to know the contribution of the marginal effects, so we just look at beta 1 times x1. So this is called the marginal effects, and we also have beta d times xd, other contributions from other variables. So we have either coefficients, which is sensitivity of the variable, which is basically like a derivative. Right, and then we can also have marginal effects, which is combined like a beta times x. So you have these two different ways to explain the model. Then how can we extend this to to complex model? Right, for complex complex model, it's not a local linear model. Uh, it's not a linear model, but it can be local linear model approximation. So this is actually the idea by Lime, uh, which is developed by Riberio and the company in 2016. Uh, it's this is a highly cited paper. No, it's, it's a, it's a, it was very pioneering at that time. So the idea is to fit a local linear model around individual pr uh, predictions. Say, for example, on the right-hand side, top right. So this chart is from the paper. So I should acknowledge that, right? So then uh, I think this paper, this diagram is quite famous, right? But uh, the, the, the idea is that for this like a red cross here in the middle, right? How can I explain this? So you see the, the, the response shape is very compli complicated overall. But for center around this uh, red cross here, cross here, so we can just approximate with a local linear model. How can we do that, right? We can simulate data points around this X, sorry, uh, this is uh, like a cross, 
then in the neighborhood, right? In the neighborhood, then we can compute the prediction of all of these. Then we have this f hat, and we treat this as a response. Then we feed a local linear model. That's the idea, okay? So, and then uh, due to like uh, sampling, you know, and the weight is actually inverse proportional to the distance because the, the points are uh, far away from the uh, from target point, which take less weights. But the, the points is close, then we take a, like a larger weights. So that's the idea. So we feed a weighted local, uh, linear regression model. So then we have this like a linear model. We can just do either explaining by coefficients or by marginal effects. So on the right hand side, you know, which we have this local weights and effects. This actually, we have two legends. One is this kind of line, one is the bars. You know, this is something we developed based on uh, based on line package. So like a line has only like an effect, but we also include the marginal effects, right? Not only just the weights, not only just the coefficients, right? Sometimes we'll look at uh, like a marginal effect, which may be more important in a real practice. Okay, so the bars, which is a marginal effect, beta times x. But the, like lines are just a beta. Okay. However, as I explained on the uh, this like last uh, sentence here, this local explanation results actually depend very much on the neighborhood size, right? Suppose you want to have a small size or larger size, the results will be different. Okay. And it also depends on the how how you sample the points in the neighborhood. Now by default, right, like lime actually do that Gaussian sampling. A Gaussian sampling with like independent uh, correlations, so they actually ignore like feature correlations. Which can be problem, problematic, right? Because the data usually is not independent. Okay, so this is about line. Next one, Shep. <clears throat> Shep is based on a very famous work by Shapley, uh, Professor Shapley, which is a Nobel Prize winner. So uh, actually, in 1953, a long, long time ago, right? So Shapley uh, actually proposed this kind of so Shapley on the right hand side of the formula. Right, which is based on the combinatorials, you know, with different like subsets, and uh, you just take a like a variable off, or take out, then uh, you compare with the original variable, what's the like difference, and then you do the weighted F, weighted sum, and sum them together, and then you would have this so called phi i, which is the Shapley value, and it has nice properties as like uh, like efficient symmetry additivity, so on and so forth, right? So this is uh, for Shapley, and uh, but uh, the problem is that it's a combinatorial, you know, it's an NP-hard problem. It's very, very computationally intensive, right? So in order to compute this, especially when the dimensionality is high, this is super, super slow. So exponential, exponential complexity in the dimensionality. So the, which is maybe okay for one variable, two, uh, two, two variables, three variables, variables, right? But if you have like more than 10 or even 20 plus variables, this will become super, super slow, right? So to, then to solve this problem, actually Shep, uh, so the, the, the the method like now today popular in, in uh, machine learning proposed by Landerberg and Lee from University of Washington in the, the also same year as the Ribeiro. Ribeiro also, yeah, by the way, Ribeiro is also from, also from uh, Washington. I think they're, all, they're both working in Microsoft today. So they did, they really like a productive, you know, you have many, many interesting methods and the they actually provide, proposed um, different ways to approximate chapter value. Okay, basically, this, you, you remember Shapley uh, uh, represents Shapley additive like uh, explanations, right? So uh, they actually use some additive model to approximate this. And uh, then to do a better job, they have some kernel Shap methods. They have, uh, by the way, they have the like, linear Shap and other Shap, right? But the uh, most popular is the kernel Shap because for black box models, which is not a linear model. So kernel Shap is uh, very powerful, but it's very slow, okay? It's a super slow, we'll demonstrate that. And the tree Shap is, uh, is, is a faster method. For trivial methods like uh, XGBoost, like a, a GBM, random forest. Okay, tree shape is super fast compared with uh, kernel shape. However, uh, just like Lime, they have like unrealistic assumption, like uh, you know independence, and like other things, like uh, you know some approximation, you know crude appro approximation, maybe through some kind of truncation up to a certain degree, you know. So they they because this is like essentially it's a highly combinatorial, so we cannot do all of that. We have to do some kind of like a, a approximation, and also a different different this is like different methods. For example, kernel shape and tree shape, they sometimes give different different results. So even contradicting with each other, so sometimes these results are not reliable, and I will show why, right? And explanation results depending on the input data as well. Okay, and that can sometimes be 
attacked or manipulated. Okay, or be fooled. So on the right hand side, you see this is like a waterfall plot uh, of a sharp, uh, the recent version of sharp stable version. So our like temperature, right? But the, when you read the chart, you should read it from the bottom up. Okay, bottom up, you have this arrow up to here, then this is going to the uh, left hand side, then going right, you know, and uh, you know, so on and so forth. Now, and then the most important variable goes to the top, which is our variable, it has a larger uh, the band, and then the temperature second. Okay, so the, you will see that which variable is contribute more important for the, for the individual prediction. Okay, this is based on Shapley. So far, I have two results. Okay, you know, you will see this, this, this actually, these two results explaining the same prediction, but they're different. But I will have another slide to show that. Okay, now let's come to like a global tool. A glo oh, sorry, this is not local explanatory, this is a typo. This should be global explanatory tools, sorry. So global tools, including PFI, VI, sharp, okay? PFI is like basically by permutation for any prediction model. So you random uh, for, for a variable of interest or uh, a pair of variables, it can be multiple. Just for one, say, let's do one variable for now. So each variable or column of interest, if you're uh, interested, then interested in that, you just random permute that variable while keeping other variables unchanged. Then you just compute the difference in the model prediction performance that you will have the PFI. And the VI is based on tree method, of our tree methods is based on gene, uh, the purity measure, purity. You know, I will go this quickly because many of the, you may be already familiar with this. And Shapley, Shapley FI is uh, average hey, agent, the absolute. Sorry for interrupting agent. You need yep. to speak. Yeah, it goes. Sorry, you need to speed up a little bit on the post hoc because you are already spending an hour on this. And you need oh another hour on the uh, FANOVA, okay? So you need to I speed see, up. I see, sure, sure, yeah. The is here, right? So I show two results on the right-hand side. So one is a PFI, one is like a variable importance. You see these results are, are different as well, right? So this, and I also have PDP. I, I'm not gonna explain that. The PDP plot, ICE plot, which is an individual version, which average that will be become PDP. And then we have AOE, you know, AOE method, which is uh, another method, uh, you know, uh, which uh, modify PDP. And this is results are different as well. So we have different methods uh, So for, for, for that, right? But now what's the puzzle? So but essentially, I will, as we will do the demo, okay, as we will, we will do the demo, uh, wait, let me hide here. Okay, we'll do the demo by uh, bike sharing data set, which I just demoed, right? So in, we will do XG Booster. This is based on the XG Booster with step seven, some of uh, like uh, 500 estimators of trees. So we have this model, the same model, exactly the same model, same data set, right? Then we do the, the feature importance. We can do PFI, we can do variable importance from XGBoost. You see the results, which one is the most important? Is, is it the HR, hour, or is it the month? The second one is weekday, right? But a weekday has different magnitude and holiday, right? You see these results are different. So now the question is which one is more trustworthy, right? And uh, sometimes people don't really care and uh, they just do, do it randomly. And that, that's a problem, right? And also for PDB and ALE, you see, as this is also, uh, you know, illustrated in our original paper for this data set, you know, this one has a big job at the end for the temperature, uh, high temper for the high temperature, you know, people don't like to ride bicycles. They have a very small, like uh, rentals, which is more, it seems like more reasonable than the PDB plot. Okay. And on the right hand side, they, they uh, explain the same prediction. Above one is uh, like uh, for, for lime, below one is for chef. You know, the most important is the year or is it the hour, right? Or is the temperature, you know, the temperature is second, right? But still again, year and a year, you know, and you see the different uh, direction, you know, sometimes, right? So for example, you know, these this are totally different. So this is a so-called puzzle, okay? Now let's demonstrate that, okay? So let's do the demonstration. I, I, I need to speed up. We have too many materials to show. Okay, so I actually have all of this here. So I, uh, to save time, uh, you can just run this because all of this is rep reproducible. So you just run XGBoost model, right? XGBoost, as I mentioned, that we do like a max depth seven, number of estimators, which is number of trees, 500, right? Then you can register this existing model to the pipeline. Uh, not, this is not a fit yet, right? You fit it, you fit it, then you have the model. Then you can use this command to check the accuracy, you know, but this is not the key point for, for the time being. So now, this is a good model, suppose, right? We have this model, we wanna expand. So we can do importance. So I already you know, showed in the slides, this is exactly the same chart as in the slide. So you just run this from like a model, uh, you know, from XGBoost. 
it has this so called like a uh, get a boost uh xgb right product importance you will have this results like months is most important however if you want to if you want to do uh, differently use psyche long or use this uh, primary toolbox you have this model explained with x boost of but global pfi do you see that pfi our is most important and then, okay sometimes people okay maybe i want to try a different method say i want to try like a sharp method sharp fi just around sharp fi we already you know, give that wrapper in the pyml global sharp fi you see that our year but this time this seems like closer to a permutation but, but the second one weekday is not sure here second one is a year you see the difference right different methods give you different uh, explanation results now the big question is which one do you trust okay that's the big question that's the called a puzzle okay the same thing for pdp right we have this pdp and i just run this global pdp with this one right and also you have this like uh uh, model explain with the global ICE. This is the result showing that you see that some kind of interaction here. It's not parallel, which means interaction. But given the interactions, oh, sorry, correlation, I should say correlations, right? So given the correlations, the AOE may perform better, right? So AOE have a better result than this. Okay, but AOE can do also two, two dimensional hidden map that we will show that maybe later. So they also have some problem, okay? And now for local inter interpretation, you can just do like a yeah, it's command is pretty much the same, just a model explain, right? Model, you specify the model, then show with different, uh, like, uh, you know, pointer. So now it's a local line, local explainability for line. This is the result I explained in the slides for the sample index equal to one, right? The, the second data point. Also, you can do the same thing for share sample index equal to one, right? You see the results, our temperature, our temperature, but right here, year temperature. Okay, so if you look at it like a weights, that's also different, right? Weights like this one, but second one, the year and you know temperature. They're not the exact same. They're quite different. Okay, even they have the wrong, wrong direction. You know the same direction, but this is a positive and negative. They're not. They're totally contradicting. Okay, so this is also called the puzzle. I, I would stop here. So I would leave this to you. Because the notebook is on the on the on the, on the GitHub. Uh, I assume some of you may already try this. Okay, you try this offline. Uh, I mean, some simultaneously, you may get the same exactly same results. Uh, especially on collab, every result would be reproducible. So now let's let's move to next one. Okay, let's no, 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 next topic because this like black box models with post hoc methods have problems. Now, how can we do models which are more trustworthy, right? Which are more interpretable? So now let's discuss how to design. You know, from the beginning, how to design inherently interpretable models, you know, that we already know some statistical models which are interpretable, but the statistical models are too simple, right? Sometimes they have not perform good performance, right? So the idea, okay, I, I will skip this. I just basically I already explained what's the inherent versus what's the post hoc. You know, basically, uh, post hoc a lot of like, uh, you know, as a demo, just demoed, right, by Pamil, that often produce results with disagreements. So, and uh, according to Professor C.C. Rudy, this is called a double trouble. What is a double trouble, right? The first trouble is black box models, which is a black box. And then we, when you apply another auxiliary, post hoc explainer, which is another black box, sounds like, right? So we have black box on black box. So which is, this is called a double trouble, okay? Now, to design, so here actually, uh, uh, Aguz and I, we had a paper last year. So we actually, if some of you, if you're interested, you can click on this link. So this link, uh, this slide will be shared, right? You can click on the link and you get a, will direct you to the archive paper. So in this paper, we, we discussed how to design, you know, uh, interpret model from model characteristics, like additivity, sparsity, linearity. And then we also explain all of these, you know, why they are important, right? For the additivity, so if the model can be additively decomposed into different features, then we can, we know how to interpret that separately because it's the additive. Right, but sometimes we, we, you know the models we also want to enforce, for example, smoothness or monotonicity. So we can also enforce this kind of constraint in the model. So by this, this is called architecture constraints, right? Given this kind of architecture constraints, then we have the following design framework. Okay, the previous slide I will leave that to you to digest because there are quite a lot of details we, we don't have that for the time constraint. I, I need to speed up. Okay, so this interpret machine learning design framework. So we we, we we you know we can do from the two directions. One is the, you know jointly, right? So one is the feature selection. We should select the features which are meaningful, right? Otherwise, we cannot explain it. Even we have the 
we know the feature, but the feature is X or X, Y, Z, right? We need to know what is X, what's the meaning, what's the background, practical meaning of that to have a good explanation or interpretation. And, uh, and uh, we want to focus more on the architecture constraints, right? As I mentioned in the previous slide, we want to have the model to be additive or some super modular. We want to have the model which has sparse because the more variables means difficult, it's more difficult uh, to explain, but if you have a, small, a few number of uh, features, that is relatively easy to explain, right? And also the monotonic constraints for some variables, based on the experience, we want some variable to be monotonic, then we should enforce that. And also the orthogonality, right? And also this idea actually uh, first appeared in a paper we, we, fin we, we, we wrote in uh, 2019. Uh, now it's accepted by uh, last year by uh, IEEE TNNS. So this is called ex enhancing ex explainability of neural networks through architecture constraints. Okay, this is the idea first comes. So of special interest is the FANOVA. Okay, I will explain what is FANOVA uh, based on this, uh, by this so-called architecture constraint. FANOVA is actually strongly, you know, using additive constraint, uh, constraint of modular, but in a hierarchical way. So FANOVA model design framework is actually to decompose a multivariate function. Suppose this is a, like a very complicated function, right? Or like true response, right? We want to decompose into different components, say G0, which is an intercept, it's a scalar. And also each individual variable, marginal effects, this is like so called main effects, and then two, two fat interactions, and so on and so forth, right? But for better inter interpretation, sometimes we just want to stop maybe by two fat interaction. Then this is called sort of SOTA, SOTA works. One is like uh, by uh, Microsoft research, so called uh, explainable boosting machine. EDM is exactly following this FANOVA framework by truncating the effect up to second order. Okay, just so G0 plus G, uh, uh, J and GJK for the two fat interactions and, uh, you know, neglecting the high order interactions. And also the work, uh, another way is to sort of game in neural networks. So the, this is what our work, which is also uh, accepted for publication in pattern recognition uh, last year. So the difference between these two methods is that explainable machine, uh, boosting machine EVM is based on the trees. And the GAMI is based on neural networks, and I will show the difference, okay? And also, uh, as I mentioned, like PyML already, already integrate both of these methods, and with this like four verbs, right? Interpret, explain, diagnose, and compare functionalities. Okay, let's, let's move fast to the next one, okay? Uh, before we uh, discuss this one, right, so we wanna talk about GAMI, but well, first of all, we need to understand what is neural network, okay? But let me do this really quick. Okay, and uh, it turns out that when the activation function is ReLU, rectify the linear unit, the DNA can be can become transparent, can be interpretable. But upon unwrapper, so-called Alasia wrapper, this is also one of our developments, and also specification. Let's, uh, let's show why, right? I just should uh, quickly demo. This is, uh, some of you may already play the right playground from TensorFlow. You will have this kind of like a uh, interface, like a front page. You just click then so you can choose a, a set of set, set, a data set, set called SUCO. It's two dimensional. And you can select different number of layers. Say this is four layer with hidden the new units, six units uh, in each layer. And the ReLU activation, ReLU is this form, so called king function, right? And then the right hand side is a prediction. And you see the prediction is pretty well. It's like a COSUCO. COSUCO, that's a concentric circle, one inner side, one outer side, right? In the middle is a decision boundary. You see that it separates like these two class pretty well, right? So this is like so-called DNA. It does a very good job for prediction. However, it does not answer the question, the following, right? Given this prediction, high, high, you know, highly predictive model, how can we interpret, okay? How can we interpret this kind of mechanism, right? So this is like a big question we, we, we were to solve. So that actually turns out, I, I, yeah, I, let me skip this. This is just a demonstration of the two-dimensional. It, it turns out, it turns out the ReLU activation, each layer is doing like a partitioning. So uh, based on some uh, device, mathematical device called activation pattern. So using this activation pattern, then it turns out each neuron, each neuron is just like a, a, a knife. Okay, just like a, like a knife, a straight cut of the surf of the space, right? This is a knife cutting here, one no, neuron. Yeah, I, I still have to refer to this, right? Okay, so this diagram, we have like a simple, simple one, right? Two layers, the first thing here, they have two neurons, right? One neuron, another neuron two neurons, then second layer has four neurons, okay? Keep in mind, we have two neurons in the second, first layer, four neurons in the second layer. How, is the, how they do the job, right? The, first, the two neurons in the first layer, this is the first cut, 45 degrees, then another cut, 135 degrees, right? 
cut the space into four, four quadrants, four parts. And each part then is further recursively, recursively partitioned by the second layer, just like a tree, but the tree is horizontal or vertical. But here with this oblique card, right? This is an oblique card within each neuron, but this one is, you see this zero, zero, which is already, already dead, dead, dead neurons. Zero means like it's not active. Like one is active. Like one is active, the other one is not active. For this zero, zero, both neurons are active, uh, are inactive, then it, they will no longer be put the cut it in the second layer. For this one, one neuron is active, the other one is inactive. They just cut a lot one neuron, okay? And the same thing for the right, right quadrant. And for the one on top, which both neurons are active, one and one, right? So then along both dimen uh, dimensions, they were cut with four line, four, four, four cuts, four knife cuts, okay? You will see they cut, it, cut it, uh, partition the space into multiple parts. So this is actually, uh, by theory, we prove that, we show that each activation pattern by the literature, you know, was, we refer to the literature, this is the existing result. So it's actually partition the space into convex, convex regions. Each region is a convex, okay, exclusively. The, so it's a, it's a disjoint partition of the space. Given this, and it's more interesting that what's, what model, inner model, just like, remember line, line is a local linear model for each region, which is by approximation in a post hoc way. But for ReLU DNA, it turns out each, each region is supported theoretically exactly by a local linear model. That's the following important theorem, okay? We actually prove that within each region, just like one here, a color region here, there's a, a single local linear model within the region, a linear model, okay, locally. So the local linear model, the, for, the formation is by, the, by this theorem, okay? If you're interested, read this paper, okay? So this, this is like some mathematical pro, and we have some trick, very easy to derive this, okay? So then each of this, just like here, right? So this is on the right-hand side, this, this is a data set, right? Have many, many partitions. Each partition is supported by local linear model, which is a green line on the, on the right-hand side. Now the problem shows. For this data set, simple cost super data set, just like a playground in TensorFlow, right? We use like two hidden layers, just instead of four, right? With 40 nodes each layer, and it's a very predictive, very predictive. And the performance of the AUC is like more than like 93%, or about 93%, right? Uh, I mean, 0.93. So this is a good performance model. However, if we use this called like this theory, as I just mentioned in the CRM, or the, the, the activation pattern, the partitioning, it turns out it results into more than 200 regions, more than 200 regions. And each region is supported by local linear model. And some of regions are very small, right? And it turns out more than 40% of like regions have only a single data point. See here, some of these regions are very super tiny. In a tiny region, it has only a single data point. Now the question is, if it's just a tiny region with a single data point, is that reliable? That's the question, right? That's a big question again, right? So the model is transparent. You know how they become a glass box, but a glass box models is not the equivalent to interpretability in robustness, because in this case it's transparent, but the many the local linear models are only, you know, a single data point or a support, which is not reliable. So we have to enhance, right? We have to find a way to enhance, how to enhance the interpretability or robustness. So a direct thought is that Let's reduce the number of regions, right? Let's reduce that. So that's so called the next one. How to do simplification, right? In statistics, we have the so called lasso or L1 regularization. So we can do the same thing. Let's just regularize the neural weights, okay? Let's regularize that. So that, for example, this is the new regularize. You have the different strands from the left to right. The model, the performance become degradation, you know, which is by the red curve, sorry, by the green curve. Actually, it's a stats flat, then drop. But the red curve, red curve is like a number of local linear model, smaller and smaller, which means the region is smaller and smaller in this animation. You see that, right? Let's see if, again, from very many, a lot of regions and it's still reduced to smaller and smaller, smaller and smaller, right? At the end, you know, there's, it can just become one region or two regions, right? So region, region which is too simplified. So we should optimize somewhere in the middle. So you see this kind of change point, so called anchor. So this anchor, as I mouse pointing to, it has a high performance, but the number of regions is super small, right? So this actually reduced to, uh, becomes the one on the right hand side. It has only this smaller number of regions, but the performance is pretty much the same. 
but the complexity is much smaller and it becomes more interpretable. So using this idea, so let's try. Let's try it. Uh, we'll do the demo. The results is here. Let's just summarize the, let's summarize the results for that. I show the demo. So let's use a time credit data set, right? Time credit data set. So that's another credit, credit modeling data set, which is very popular in, in the industry today. Most of the AI companies, they, use, they like to use time credit, but they may do it a bit, a bit like a, a different from what we do. I will show what, what's the difference, okay? So let's use ReloDNA with like a dance version, which is not regularized a lot. And with another regularization, higher penalty. Now you see that, you know, the origin, the, in this case, dense version has more than 6,000 local linear models. It is reduced to only 16. And then you see the, the diagram. This is like a local linear model, the weights. The one above is very difficult to explain. And sometimes it's a controversy, right? Some of the results cannot be negative, but uh, you know, they have both positive and negative. Obviously some of the local linear models are not right. Right, if we regularize to have a smaller number of local linear models, the model becomes very reasonable and also much easier to interpret. And on the right hand side, I see the performance is very competitive, right? 0.77 and 0.76. Do you prefer the one which is really 0.77? And or instead of like a sacrifice the interpretability, right? That's if I if I were you, I'd prefer the second one, right? The smaller one. Okay. And then also the robustness, uh, yeah, this is the topic we want to discuss in the next session. I just put it here for your, just for your, for a preview, but I will explain that later about the model robustness. Okay, let, let, let's do the demo, demo again, do the demo, okay? Uh, take time. Let's do the demo. I have another data set already prepared. You know, let's reconnect. Yeah, although I'm, I don't have time to run it, but the results is already there. You, you should have that new book. In, in here, right? You just have this little book. The second little book, Taiwan credit example. Click on here, you will have the same thing as I have, okay? So here you see that we have this same thing, data dashboard, uh, but loading the data, remove certain variables. Yeah, I, I, I wanna mention a little bit here. Why I wanna remove this variable? Gender, education, marriage, okay? This data has this age, uh, also limit balance, especially age. Uh, sex, uh, sex, uh, gender, right? Education, marriage. Why should we exclude that? Because this variable is demographic. In, in a credit risk modeling, these variables are not allowed to use because, you know, for the fair lending purpose, we cannot include these variables. Let's we include that, uh, exclude them. Okay. So this variable is included. Then we fit the data. You know, we do the EDA. Then we fit the so called relu DNA. I fit two models, right? You just uh, click on here, model trend. You can specify a model relu DNA with a dense version, uh, which is like a you know the original version 0 0.00001, right? Uh, uh, which are called relu DNA. Then you can customize he here with a different uh, threshold, uh, L1 regularization. I mean uh, strength uh, to uh, to be another number. This is actually an optimized one. Or off I optimize that offline. So 0 0.0008 instead of like 0 0.00001. Okay. So this is like a dense uh, uh, sparse version. So we see that this kind of like a performance is a little bit uh, uh, lower than the dense version in the leaderboard, test AUC, right? Test AUC, let's look at that, right? However, if you look at the test ACC, sparse version is even better. Interesting, right? 8.2, uh, 8 to 8, but this is 8 to 6. To 6. But AUC, relu DNA and dense version is the winner. Okay, it's a winner. Right, 0.77, and it is 0.76, right? Just a very small, tiny difference. Okay, both models are registered, right? Just choose here to register. Register, then you can do interpretation. You see the results on the right hand side, right? So many number of the linear models. And I, I know the results is very misleading. For example, pay one, lots of ones like a payment status. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes negative. And this is not right because it should be not also always like a proportional, like a monotonic. Just pay one, like if you pay delinquency, you know, more severe delinquency, the risk is higher, right? It cannot be a negative trend. So this is a problem, but if we just train it as a black box, we cannot see this kind of facts. So that's why we need to have this kind of initial tool or PyML. PyML will help us to do the job, okay? To see how to do the unwrapper, how to see what's inside. Okay, now let's do regularize. And then we have another model in here. Right, just a 16 local linear models. And uh, also, if you look at like this kind of feature, uh, so called effect plot, local linear model, this is a local linear model, local linear model along P1, they're all non-active trends. 
and this is obviously more reasonable, right? So this uh, by here, I, 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 I just the demo demonstrated rather than a okay? sparse version would enhance model transparency, model interpretability, and then in the future we'll show that specification or DNA would also enhance model robustness. Okay, so that's for this part. I have another part. Okay, I'm really on the rush. Uh, I I may have prepared many materials. Okay, so now let's talk about FANOVA, right? Uh, just now, real DNA is still it's a DNA. Sometimes it's a uh, you know sixteen local DNA models, or you know sometimes maybe more more than that. So which may be still not as interpretable, but we mentioned that we have another framework, function ANOVA, right? ANOVA will can make, make it uh, like a much easier, right? more straightforward to interpret. Let's see how, okay? So first of all, let's explain, like ANOVA, actually we have two different model, uh, examples. One is EBM for Microsoft. It, it is really good, good, good one. And we developed another one, gaming net, okay? And we'll uh, introduce both of them, okay? And both methods have main facts plus Pairwise interaction per zoid, okay? Per zoid, by per zoid, I mean some optimization happening, okay? Right, original uh, model is so-called GA2M model, uh, proposed uh, like uh, years ago uh, by Lo and uh, uh, Dr. Karuna, right? Uh, when they are from uh, you know, working in Cornell, I think. So they have this kind of model, uh, you know, and and then, then you know, here should have an intercept, but, I, but which is fine, right? We have the main fact in the compared interactions. And this is rebranded, re rebranded in 2019 in so-called uh, interpret ML, right? Interpret ML, they recall it uh, with a different name, a more fancy name, EBM. I think this is a good one, right? It's pretty much like a GBM, but it is a EBM. Uh, uh, it has a fast implementation based on C++ and Python. So basically it uses shallow tree, right? Uh, on the, like uh, here, just cut the space with two cards, right? You don't have, you would have some interact, uh, you know, one color you main facts and uh, shallow, right? One variable at a time capture many facts. If two variable cut will give you interactions. So called depth one and depth two. Okay, this is some details. Uh, I don't have time to explain. I, I would leave it here. So if you have any questions, you can post the issues in GitHub or send me email so privately, okay? Then, we develop it based on this idea, right? Because this is based on a tree, and I will show this tree idea. Sometimes it's a step function. Step 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 functions is something you know. We, we sometimes we want some smooth functions, right? So the smooth functions have would have better interpretability. So that's the motivation we come up with. So called uh, instead of using trees, instead of using like a boosting trees, we use like neural networks, right? Neural networks is also very very powerful. So we develop this uh, like a uh, so-called two stages, uh, actually three stage. So we have the first stage like to fit the main facts uh, to some pruning. And then we have like uh, from the residuals, then fit the pairwise interactions. So we have like a second, uh, like bivariate uh, inputs. This is a one, single input. This is a two inputs on the right-hand side, like orange one, right? And then we combine them. And finally, we have a retraining stage like to put them together. By the way, I have to acknowledge that like the faster algorithm from like EBM from Microsoft is really helpful. We actually take that and uh, you know and use that for the screening purpose. It uh, does help. So th this is uh, you know one of the advantage we you know we combine the force from EBM. And then we, but we, the modeling part we based uh, we use this so called like a, a neural network training uh, scalable, which is very scalable because you know it's about SGD. So it's a scalable with mini batch, right? So then we can do this like uh, you know in a scalable way and uh, you know but uh, also. Other than this kind of additive FANOVA structure, we impose other constraints just for the, you know, just a, a, like I mentioned, like a design framework for interpretive machine learning, right? For the purpose, right, of making the more interpretable, we purposefully enforce some, impose some constraints like sparsity. Instead of using all the effects, we just select those important ones, sparsity, okay? Not only main effects, but also pairwise interaction. We do this uh, pruning or sparsity, for sparsity, sparsity purpose. And also we have some heredity. Sometimes we have this kind of assumption, like uh, interactions should come from uh, inherit, uh, inherited from um, from a main, uh, you know, main facts. But this is optional. You can turn it on or turn it off. And we also have like a marginal clarity to make them kind of orthogonal for the sake of like a uh, function ANOVA. Because the function ANOVA standard version actually require the effects to be orthogonal with each other. 
So we, we, we have some, uh, you know, trick to do that. It's called marginal clarity based on empirical data uh, metric. Okay, as a constraint or penalty, we impose this penalty to make it more marginal clarity, so also called nearly orthogonal. And also this uh, gave me that support so called mon monotonicity. In banking, uh, many of the models, especially credit uh, scoring models, the monotonicity is very important for some variables, like for example, credit score, right? Like if I could score, you, you must have that um, maybe like a decreasing, right? Higher score means uh, the, the, the lower risk. You cannot have uh, like a uh, uh, increasing decreasing. It has to be strictly decreasing, right? So then we have to enforce this, and then we develop this and put this into you know, the, the method. Okay, so we have this kind of uh, considerations for interpretation purpose. And also we have another version using TensorFlow Lattice. Okay, this is just one version. We have multiple versions. Then also we further develop what's, or what's lacking in EBM, but uh, we have developed that for, uh, for function level in general. So we have the individual features, right, including uh, pairwise interactions. And then these pairwise interactions, like we can, it's actually so called a true to model. So it's a model based, right? So we have the interpretation of feature importance for each individual point, right? Now, how can we get a global feature importance, right? Global feature importance, we have effect version, but we can also have the feature, feature version for each uh, aggregated on each feature. Say like a variable including X1 main facts, but another interactions X1 and X3, right? X1 and X3 is also including X1. How can we attribute them aggregatedly, you know, aggregate them to X1? Right, so then we can have by some derivation. We have this formula, so we can have like aggregated based on the like data. Then we have this like empirical version, uh, a centered one that we have like a so feature importance uh, based on the formula. Okay, and then this like effect can be also this is like a single index, right? But for the curve, it can be visualized by line plot for many facts and hit the map for the pairwise pairwise interactions. Okay. So here's a pros and the cons, but uh, before uh, before I talk about this, let's let, let's let's do the demo, okay? Let's do the demo. Uh, okay, demo. Maybe I should uh, start with some results. Okay, let, 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 let me show the results first. Uh, then I will go to the demo. Okay. So I just feed the same data by sharing, you know, as I learned at the beginning uh, for X goals, right? But now I we choose like by sharing data. Uh, a FANOVA. It's about it's GBM, EBM, and FN, uh, gaming app. You see these step functions, right? For our, our, our turns out to be most important. In EBM is 26% out of 100%. But for GAMINAD, it's 50% nearly, right? Uh, it's like a more, even more important. And the curve, you see the difference, right? One is piecewise linear because we use ReLU DNA uh, as a sub network modeling. It's piecewise linear, you know, it's a smooth, a smooth, a smoother, right? Compared with like uh, this, like step functions. But the overall trend is more or less the same. But uh, sometimes it uh, does not have this kind of small wiggles. It's just like a you know just a straight uh, straight line fit, okay? Right? And uh, here's a straight line fit. Uh, so we have like a less number of bases. You, you hear for for Caminet. and then you see like a GBM like because it does not have a pruning. It uh, inter one intercept. In total, we have nine nine variables, nine variables uh, after ex ex excluding those season, this eight temperature, and also working day. So what's remaining is nine variables. Nine variables, all nine main facts are included in EBM. And I also include 10 maximum effects, 10 maximum, okay? And also GAMINET will also do 10 maximum, but it's not a result, as a result, it has only nine effects. And also out of nine main effects, we have seven because we have this so-called pruning, sparsity. So we have a total number of effects is smaller. However, the, sorry, this is another typo. This should be test MSE, okay, test MSE. MSE, this is a regression problem. Sorry, I, I, I will correct that typo. Test MSE for EBM is, uh, you know, 6.9. And uh, gaming data is 3.6. MSE is much better. I'll show on, also on the uh, right, uh, top right corner, right? This is this, uh, this panel. So EBM, the test performance, training performance is uh, much higher in terms of MSE. However, for gaming data, it's much better, much, much better. Okay, also in terms of reliability, some of something we want to discuss next, next, uh, next week. Okay, I will leave it to next week. Okay, as a preview. So now let's do the demo. This is the results, uh, the screenshot from the from the from the notebook. So I already have this. Let's let's just uh, switch back to uh, bike sharing. Bike sharing also already run that. So to save time, let's just go to that directly. The Nova, right? You see this? I don't know whether I should really click around to show. 
uh, but I don't have time. Yeah, maybe I, if I have time, a minute, I can do that, right? Let, let me explain a little bit, okay? So here you say, just do that. Yeah, uh, let me just do, do, do click, okay? Let me just click. Yeah, you just click, click this, right? You just, you will have this, right? How can you train the model? Right, basically you have this EBM, you have right DNA, which I already demonstrated, right? Uh, for example, just now, I didn't have time to de demo that. You can have this regularization for dance, and you can choose this, so like have a sports version, Say point point eight, then you have like a so you give it a different name. So you have a different model, right? So that's for uh for Red DNA, which I already dem demoed, uh just for makeup, okay, purpose. But now let's focus on EBM and gaming that, right? EBM, you see that number of interactions is like parameters you can specify to be 10 by default. Okay, all others uh, leave it leave it there, right? If you're interested, you can play with, with that as well, right? And again, in that we have more control, more flexibility, like here. Yeah, you see here, right? Yeah, we also specify 10 interactions maximum, and I have batch size built is scalable mini batch, right? For SGD. Uh, yeah, by the way, I should uh, uh, mention that like uh, Microsoft and Google, uh, the hint, they have something called a neural editing model, and also Meta, Meta Facebook recently have neural based, neural basis model. They are subsets of this gaming app. That's something I, 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 I think I need to mention, mention a little bit, okay? So they're actually part of gaming because we have, yeah, they're called scalable because this gaming app is also scalable. Okay, anyway, so this batch size, we can specify monotonic constraints, increasing and decreasing if we want, and a subnet size and epoch and the mean rates, right? We have all the controls, but let's just uh, uh, leave them uh, by default. Let's run it, okay? If you just run it, it'll take time, you know, uh, run it on real time. Uh, yeah, it takes time, but uh, the model is already there. You also already have this model registered, right? Uh, let's see. No, it's a game that is, uh, EVM is already here. Uh, take 11 seconds. Game that will be a double or triple because you gave me that a lot of more constraints, right? For example, we have this kind of like sparsity, and then we have this uh, like a near uh, cl a marginal clarity, and also other constraints. Uh, so it take a bit more time. Also, it's based on neural network training, and neural network training is uh, slower than tree 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 fitting, you know, tree training. So I don't know. I think that's reasonable. But let's see how slow it can be. Or collab. Okay, uh, it may be 30 or something. Yeah, take time, it take time, right? So uh, by the way, you can use it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's gone, it's done, okay? You see that gaming net, 42 seconds. Oh, today it's a bit unlucky. It has, it depends on the, on, on the, on the uh, CPU, uh, whether it's occupied, right? So you see here, a gaming net is the performance you see here, right? 36, this is a 669. MSC, game analysis is much, much better. Okay. And then let's see the interpretation. Right. Interpretation, I already have that. EBM, right? EBM is this other feature importance, also effect importance. Aggregated, you don't have the hour, most important, temperature second. Right. And then you have this kind of individual marginal effects for hour. We see this kind of shape 26.5% important. Okay. You can see also have this kind of like a two fat interactions. Okay. And then gaming. Okay. Gaming that. We also have this result. You see, the results are pretty similar, right? So uh, our temperature year, months, our temperature year, months, our temperature year, months, uh, but not months, this is a weekday. So weekday and the month is the fourth, the, the number four, you know, important variable is, is switched with number five, right? So this is pretty much uh, very close. Actually, the results are very close. I should say very competitive to each other. And then this is um, 49. Okay, but the performance, you see, right, like this one, gaming is much, much better. And also the effect is much smoother. Compared to ways, this is like uh, uh, trees, okay? This was constant. And uh, we see a lot of more gradients, gradients in the heat map here, okay? This is about interpretation. And also we can do the explanation. And you see the explanation, so if we use the post-talk methods, right? This is post-talk methods, our weekday, you see, we create the number number two, but this model specific is what is temperature is more more important, right? Compared to weekday, but although the the margin is very small, but temperature is uh, more important than weekday. Okay, in both EBM and uh, and gaming net, this is like exact interpretation. This is exact. This is like a, what come from inherently from the model, but the post hoc does not recover the truth. Okay, this is again to show the puzzle with post hoc methods. Okay. So also here you see that the results are quite quite different. Uh, but anyway, uh, but this is very close. Okay, but uh, by here 
uh, I will stop for the demonstration and let, let me wrap up. Okay. Yeah, by the way, you can always play around the, the, the code. In the code, I have many other codes you know, below, some for next week and also some high high code, right? You can do that uh, just automatically. Every, just click a button. Oh, what I mean, right? I, you just uh, do here, right? Just uh, fold it uh, off, right? You fold it, right? Just click here. Everything will be run automatically. So this is called high code instead of interface, uh, which is interactive. But I think uh, low code is more important for exploration purpose, right? Uh, it's an iterative process. You always do step by step. But if we are fixed, you have a fixed uh, pipeline, you can, you can code it in a pi uh, high code pipeline, then you can make it automatic. Okay, that's the flexibility. Uh, so got low code versus high code. Yeah, this is this notable actually demonstrates all of that. Okay, I'm pretty much done, but I have another slide which I, I skipped just now. So compared with EVM, I think both methods and Gamina, uh, EVM and Gamina are both very competitive, are very promised methods, okay? Fairly speaking, I, I like both of them. Uh, it's really uh, very good. Okay, EVM, uh, you know, it has a very fast imp computation, which is very, very uh, uh, impressive, especially uh, like a fast algorithm for uh, two-factor interaction screening. Okay, uh, we actually use that in the Gamina and in the paper pub public uh, publishing work. And it also has nice uh, visualization. Uh, most importantly, EVM has like a very good support for Microsoft research uh, by a big team. And, uh, oh, sorry. And the gaming uh, advantage is that we have we support multiple constraints like sparsity, heredity, marginal clarity, and monotonicity. I think monotonicity is what's lacking in EVM, which uh, can be only done in a post post, post hoc way, post processing, but I cannot embed monotonicity inherently into the model. But we do that, okay? We do that the monotonicity inherently in, in the model, and then we have a continuous and a smooth shape functions. How, uh, but on the other hand, like EVM has uh, like a non-smooth and a jumpy shape shape functions, okay? Jumpy, sometimes very not smooth. And we also have nice visualization. And we have the important at both effect level and feature levels. Okay, this is some new developments. And we also implement, implement this for all of other Fandova models like EVM. And uh, uh, another thing is like we have both PyTorch and the TensorFlow versions for gaming app. Okay. And uh, what's lacking in EVM uh, uh, one of the I mentioned uh, also does not prove the effects. Okay, sometimes the high dimension data, we have so many effects, we cannot include all the many effects. We have to do the pruning, right? Uh, so I think that's, that's something uh, uh, worth to mention. And uh, for gaming that, uh, it has also some uh, some con, some uh, disadvantage, especially for uh, some little training, which can be a bit slow, especially when we have like uh, lots of monotonic constraints. Oh, sorry, I'm a, a inherent uh, interpretability constraint, but I think that's reasonable. That's some like a uh, price we have to pay, right? But it's not uh, super slow. It's actually you know uh, under control, and uh, so sometimes it has slight sacrifice on the predictive performance, right? But uh, today the example I show by sharing a real data set. It's uh, also some other data sets. I think it's a 50 plus 50 50. Sometimes like uh, EVM performs a bit better. Sometimes gaming performs perform a bit better. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, I would mention this, right? Because like EVM uh, gaming that sometimes maybe not that uh, flexible, especially you know. Uh, because you know, I, th I think that's the reason for game EVM is that, that the beaming they have like 256 beans, right? M make it very granular, so it capture very even small, small, tiny jumps, uh, 256 beans. But uh, you know, for game that we purposely make it a small number of basis functions, so it will sacrifice some, sometimes cannot capture the wiggles, wiggles, okay? Okay, that's pretty much I have. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will stop here. Yeah, I'll turn you three, uh, goes. Uh, let's, uh, let's open it for Q&A. Absolutely, uh, August. So I think there are a bunch of Q&A. You, you have been answering some of them in the Q&A window. That's, that's good. Um, so I think uh, one of the questions is, how do you reconcile between different interpretability results obtained from two methods, Lime and Shap, for example? Uh, HR looks, uh, I think it was specific to the example which uh, Agent was showing. HR looks more of an important variable in slide 11, but here looks more important in slide 10 when line is here. So I guess right. it's a question of reconciliation. All right. This is the problem with post hoc explainability. It's in no way that you can reconcile. So you have to apply multiple post hoc explainability tool, then make your best judgment. So don't apply the single post hoc if you do apply post hoc. 
apply multiple, realizing that they are different, understanding why they are different, and just that. So this is why we put PyML out there so that you don't have to deal with this problem. You deal with inherently interpretable model. If you just need local explainability, Deep ReLU can give you local explainability. Exact. You don't have the problem of Lime and Sharp because you know exactly the model. You know exactly the local linear equation. Yeah. So that's that. But if you need to get interpretability that more global, then you need to put additional constraint. That's exactly FANOVA. So I'm not going to use just uh, uh, deep fully connected ReLU. I am going to structure it in a way that it will be uh, with a GAMI structure. So now I have exact global explainability as well. So really depend on the application, which one you need. If you need just local explainability and that global, the global explainability you satisfy, you're okay with post hoc, then you can do the uh, uh, ReLU. But if you require re ReLU deep network, but if you require exact, you want to have exact both local explainability and global explainability, then you apply additional constraint, either EBM or GAMINET. So that's, uh, that's our process. And if you do this, and we're going to learn this one next week as well, that uh, model that is controlled regularized, it will be more robust. Next week, we're going to, uh, we're going to look at that with all the robustness testing uh, uh, that is in PyML. But I think when you, you can choose low order function of ANOVA model, be it VBM or GAMINET, to have high performance like a black box model. You can choose the upper parameter mm -hmm. to get the high performance just like black box model. Now the question is, if I have uh, interpretable model, why do I need to use black box? So the uh, thing says, if we don't have to, don't. Okay, if you don't have to use black box, don't use inherently interpretable model because you know exactly. And we know one of the problems that we have with POSOP, it doesn't tell the truth of the model. The model, uh, the explanation is not exactly tell what the model is. If we have, if we have time, we can, we can, uh, we can, we can go to uh, uh, some of the uh, example later that you, you, you try to run neural networks, for example, with the, the default value, low L1 penalty, and then you apply with higher L1 penalty, which mm -hmm. agents show that the model are very different. Yeah, one has 6,000. Remember you have 6,000 uh, local linear yeah. model, the other yeah. have 16. If you look at the post hoc explainability of this, it's the same post hoc explainability. The, the post hoc explainability cannot tell the difference between these two models. That's problematic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I think in a similar, um, there is a, you know, um, I, would, I would call this a little bit of uh, a decisioning problem. So Hussein asks, it isn't clear what the decision framework is to determine whether a situation requires interpretable ML. For example, say we have a situation where there is a non interpretable model which significantly outperforms an interpretable model, then it would adversely impact the business outcome to force ourselves to use a less performant model. We can always use SHAP to explain the more performant model. So without sacrificing performance for exact interpretability in that situation, approximately interpretable, uh, approximate interpretability like SHAP would not impose such a trade-off, however. So how would the decisioning framework look like when you are kind of you know looking at performance versus uh, interpretability. Okay. Do you have any thoughts on like you know what 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 would you think about the decisioning framework? Uh, if if the business is pushing towards here is a more performant model, but we cannot use this. I, yeah. This is what I said. Even if you think you have high performance model, yeah. Next week we're going to learn that high performance model when you test robustness, is it going to still have performance model? Mm. Most likely mm -hmm. you will not. Okay. 
when you test for robustness, because this is the problem with benign overfitting in machine learning. We're going to learn this one next week. Then okay. high performance model disappear. Okay, so we'll do that. Secondly, like I said before, the low order functional ANOVA model, you can tune the hyperparameter to have very high performance. Yeah, and then if the performance is so close, then we need to test different things. We cannot just simply look at the performance based on testing data. That is a very problematic. The Kegel stuff. Mm -hmm. We'll look at the performance based on testing data only. You win, you get the winner of two digit or third digit, you're going up in the in the Kegel competition. But in real world, your data is not the same data. A model will get exposed differently from the mod from the data that you build, you used to build. Okay, the data is dirtier in production. So model robustness is very important. So the winning model in AutoML can be the worst model very easily. So we will see that next week. Mm -hmm. So don't get enamored by this is the best model, the best performance based on testing data. Because when you put model in production, your testing data is irrelevant. It will get exposed to real world. So testing for model robustness is super, super important. We're going to learn this one next week. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. I think Eric has a comment uh, pertaining to the fair lending space. So I think the decision framework for inherently interpretable models is dependent on the model use and impact on customers for high risk applications, such as assigning a credit score to be able to be used in underwriting. There is a need for inherently interpretable models versus black box techniques. This is important for adverse action purposes as well as the UDAP examination manual has been expanded to include discrimination as an unfair practice. This also calls into question the explainability of models outside of credit underwriting. For example, how do fraud models impact customers? So this is becoming a hot topic in the fair lending space. So um, are you kind of seeing similar uh, rationale for building uh, more interpretable models in your organization, Agus? Um, is is the is the fair lending loss and other aspects? Do you have any kind of uh, thoughts on uh, right. the expanding of the purview of the regulatory agencies and how that's impacting the choice of building and using of different models? I think it's two things that we want to talk about related with the uh, the fair fairness. Yeah, first one that I want to talk about. Remember in my opening remark about model multiplicity. Remember, you can have various different models with the performance almost the same, mm -hmm. yeah? But they are not the same model. So when you look at this in the context when fairness is important, then you look at for each of those alternatives for models that perform almost the same, you test for fairness as well. So now you look at it and say, because of in terms of fairness, those models that perform almost the same in the fairness, they are different. Mm -hmm. Then you choose model that has high performance and also more fair. So this is why I don't support AutoML as is because in real world, you don't optimize just based on testing, perform, testing data performance. You need to look at the robustness. You, look, you need to look at fairness. You need to look at all of those. The beauty is in machine learning, you have model multiplicity. You mm -hmm. have choices, model that perform almost the same, but it will perform very differently with other metrics, including fairness metrics. So that's one point that's uh, in terms of uh, looking at which model to choose. Second, where the uh, explainability are so important in, the, uh, in this. Next week, when we, uh, do the uh, second workshop. We're going to do error analysis. We're going to do slicing, finding region where the model we We're going to use example, uh, mm -hmm. uh, California housing, where you can see, you can right there, you can see a model a problem with, uh, with fairness in terms of certain variable. Yeah. So wait for, for that in terms of the role of explainability uh, for, for, for fairness in, uh, in next week lecture. 
Perfect. Thank you. Um, I think I'll bucket these two questions. They're both associated with the tooling aspects and uh, also potentially the process aspects. One, do we have procedures to fine tune the hyperparameters? Yeah. Second one, uh, what's the theory behind the process of finding important interactions? Yeah. So uh, let me answer the first one and Agent will answer the second one on finding the testing of the interaction because that's what the interaction pursuit algorithms that inside Keminet and EBM. On the hyperparameter tune, uh, we thinking about putting that as, as part of the uh, of the tool. So uh, uh, we don't put it here because it's running in Google Colab and hyperparameter tuning, it takes time, long, long, long time to run, right? But we, we will we will provide that as an option that you can do hyperparameter tuning in 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 PyML in uh, in the future release. On the uh, uh, interaction pursuit, how to find interaction test for interaction uh, agent? You wanna say things? It's very simple actually, but I want agent to say it. Yeah, yeah. So for the direction, let me go to the slide. Actually. You are without slide, which is fine. Because I want to yeah. stay the, on the page of the GitHub page if the people want to install PyML. <laughs> uh, what we do is, just, you know, we take a two-stage approach, right? You feed the manifest first, and then we take the residuals. Then for the residual, then we just have to, uh, you know, uh, do the uh, so-called so screening. So we have to do the screening, use like a so-called fast algorithm. Basically, we test each one by like a fast error from uh, EBM paper. So they, you know, we do like a quick, very quick test to so based on like a, so called like a, uh, you know, two way interaction, you know, some sort of like a measure a metric. So basically, we have an objective function to rank all the all the uh, candidate interactions. Then we, uh, you know, since we specify the maximum number of interactions, so we can say select the top ten, you know, top ten. Then take that top ten and then put it include that into the model and then refine it. So that's the so-called screening. So we have this kind of screening based on the shallow tree, just like what the EBM does. It's a very smart uh, algorithm based on lookup table and uh, have some book, uh, book, uh, bookkeeping strategy. It's so very fast. Yeah, it's basically a rough a rough estimation of the interaction effect. That's like the very, top candidates. It's very, very simple to do this one. Yeah, let me try to explain it in a very simple way. If you do, uh, as, let's say, gradient boosting machine, but you limit your tree is only depth to three. Yeah. Depth to three is two ways interaction, multiplication, because you can have up to two variable. Run XGBoost or cat boost or whatever with depth to three, then you find which variable that use for splitting, that you find the, uh, you find variable, variable uh, you find the, the interaction. And, you need to rank them, which one is more important than the other. That's what basically inside the uh, uh, the, the algorithms. Okay? Perfect. Yeah, yeah. And is there an opportunity to use domain knowledge in that kind of a situation? Yeah, of course you can say, I'm going to force this interaction. And yeah. you can specify it. Okay. Cool. Uh, another question is probably support related. I think many of the examples we have looked at are predominantly cross-sectional problems. So are there models for time series or panel data um, associated with you know, things like predicting default probabilities and stuff? Yeah, like that? Uh, a couple of things. Uh, panel data, you have to put it, the format of your data into panel data. You need to have a bit more control, including when you uh, you split the data, right? So that you don't have the data leakage on the testing data. So it's really more data treatment, the preparation that you need to do. It's just like any other things. How can you use XGBoost or you, how can you use neural network for time series or final data? So you trick it with the treatment of the data input. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I think there's one more question um, associated with, are there examples on how GAMINET features are more monotonic than other models? The monotonicity constraints are imposed. You can choose which one is monotonic, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to compare uh, on the uh, monotonicity, 
it's it's basically uh, you you impose the monotonicity. How can you do it? You can compare. Let's say if you want to use GAM model, for example, yeah, you can run let's say XGPUS step one impose monotonicity. XGPUS step one will give you uh, will give you GAM model basically. Then you can you can see it, but you just visualize it. In our case, you visualize it. Look at the uh, look at the uh, the effect plot. You can see how monotonic they are. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Now, um, I was a more process related question. So, how do you kind of you know foresee the usage of this package? Do you prescribe this package to be incorporated in the model development workflow? Do you think it's more in the tool chain for you know model risk management groups? Or do you want both these teams to potentially use these methodologies? I mean, like the packages, but the methodologies. It's as a model developer, you use it for model development, right? So you bought a use model uh, model developer, you use it as model development tool, and mm -hmm. the testing tool that in the PML you use it for testing. Some of you that is a model validator, you get model from from uh, from the model developer. This is the model that they have. Now you can you can use PML as a model benchmark. If I benchmarking with this, how good is that model? That's why in uh, in PML, we, 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 you can register pre-trained model. You register pre-trained model, and then you use PML as a benchmark model. Let me compare with the, uh, with the, the, with the pre-trained model. If you model validator, you will operate that way. If you model developer, you will use it as a model development tool. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think there's one more support question, probably, you know, GAM changer, which is a part of the interpret ML, are there integration possibilities or is it easier to imp, you know, incorporate other methods? And the, the, mm -hmm. Yeah, the interpret ML, the EBM is from interpret ML. The yeah. GAM, the EBM is from interpret ML. Yeah, so I think uh, that's what in, 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 we incorporate in, in BIML. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So okay. it's a no new invention that is a Microsoft, Rich Caruana's and team of, uh, of, uh, of EBM. That's what we put in here. We okay. put some uh, processing, additional processing and visualization, but the algorithm is in the prep ML algorithms. Awesome, awesome. And is the, uh, the, the usage and the integration, I think there were some tooling questions about like, you know, the reporting and stuff like that. So. Uh, would developers be able to like add or uh, incorporate that as a part of the development of the toolbox? Um, you, yeah, you, you. This is why in the PML we put both low code and high code. If you want more flexibility for integration, you want to do more, use the high code version, right? You have a agent. You want to show the high code a little bit, agent? Sure, sure. Yeah. Can you still you you can all still see my screen, right? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, so just for example, this one, right? I just demonstrated all the flow code, right? So now suppose you do not want to repeat, do these steps step by step, right? So here I already have this high code, right? High code is the load data from the widget. You just specify the data set, or you can just do like a upload data by yourself, which is uh, which has an example in here. So upload the custom data in yeah, different, go, different ways. Go, right. Go, yeah. go to an example that is more than that, Ajun, all the plotting, all the shaft, all the FI. Go to the high code example on those. Oh, okay, oh, which is yeah. already demonstrated, right? Yeah. So, yeah, high code. Maybe let me do this when I show that uh, simultaneously. So here you see that I can just run it uh, automatically from, you know, everything is running one by one based on high code. So it's loading data, it's training black box model, and then you might train MLP, right, MLP model. But then let me explain a post hoc one, right? I was just mentioned. So all of this is based on high code. So this is this is low code. This is the, oh yeah, I have this one. This is like a high code. You see here? So, yeah. High code, you, you can do whatever. It's actually, if you have other packages, it's compatible. You can just put it here. Like uh, you have you have your own like uh, models, uh, MLP, low. you have like XGB boot. Uh, like GBM, it's all supported. The the boost, all supported, right? As long as the model is just register to the pipeline, right? Register by this single, uh, this this one. You can register into the pipeline, 
Okay, register then it becomes a model in the experimentation, the uh, PyML experimentation. Then you can do the high code, right? Just like all of this can be automatically run. Let's say global uh, yeah, explainability computation fish importance, PFI, right? And also you have shelf FI, right? You can have all the local, like uh, uh, partial dependence plot, PDP, AOE, you know, just by this, right? This is the high code based on the API, which is released in the 2.0 version. And also AOE and uh, Lime and Chef, right? If I say this is a data point, you want to do another data point, just change it. Let's say number two, they just run it, you will get the, the, the results. Yeah, that's basically what uh, Haiku does. Nice, nice. Cool. So I think we are at 12 o'clock. I wish we could extend the workshop to additional hours, but um, you know, just to keep track of the time. So we are going to wrap up the session today. I think we covered most of the questions. And thanks, Agus, for uh, answering all the questions offline in the Q&A window. So I will try and uh, you know save the save the chat window and I'll send it out to you in case there are any outstanding questions. Perhaps we could just put in like a frequently asked questions or something kind of a note. That way, some of these questions uh, which we couldn't get a chance to answer. Do you have any problem? Any question? Put it in GitHub uh, problem and ask there. We try to answer as much as possible. And yeah. I would appreciate if you visit the GitHub, give a star to the people, agents, and team that the. Uh, spend uh, a lot of energy building this too. So keep it, keep the feedbacks and show your appreciation by giving start to agents and company. All right, thank you. Yeah, I just wanna, wanna yeah, appreciate some of the uh, stars just to increase the, you know, you know this uh, two hours. So thanks for that. <laughs> appreciate, appreciate. Absolutely. And uh, uh, we are going to meet again next Wednesday between 10 and 12 o'clock East Coast time to continue the discussion. So we are going to be sharing the video and the slides which uh, Adrian and uh, Agus presented, and it's all gonna be available on QDR Academy. So I've also put in some of the slides and the labs which uh, uh, Agus and I and Vijay and others presented in a prior workshop which Adrian was mentioning in the same folder. So if you register, you'll be able to access those contents and some of the example files too. So we will see you all in another week. And if you have any questions, please reach out to Agus and Ajun and they'll be able to answer any questions. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to reconnect next week and continue the learning. Thanks again, Agus and Ajun for this wonderful workshop. I learned a lot. I know it's uh, something which uh, is tried and tested within the Wells Fargo world. So we are very pleased to kind of, uh, you know, look at all the materials you have put together and also, Kind of learning from the trenches right it's not just you know conceiving concepts and imagining how the world should be it's uh threading the the path and observing what's actually happening and modulating the process and the tooling uh appropriate to the use cases you are kind of seeing in the real world so thank you for sharing your immense knowledge with respect to that and we will reconnect in another week and continue the discussion thanks again all for attending and for your attention and we'll see you all in another week bye-bye all right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.